My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I'm very pleased to welcome our guest this evening. Tonight we have what I think will be a fascinating discussion of the way contemporary researchers of string theory and quantum mechanics are being led astray by dogmatic beliefs and various trends in thought. It turns out that, like everyone else, physicists want to keep up with the Wittens. Because we, that was a physics joke for you physicists. Okay, so it wasn't funny, it's all right. I can take it. Because we have a brilliant guest writing about a complicated topic, we needed an equally brilliant, brilliant interlocutor to help clarify the issues. To that end, please join me in welcoming the author of a number of works on physics and the personalities behind the science, including a forthcoming book with his wife, Bettina Herlin, on Enrico Fermi, Professor of Physics Emeritus at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Gino Segre. Um, I won't start by telling you all the honors Sir Roger has received, because if I did, we'd be here all night, and I might as well do without that. Let me just describe him a little bit, though, by quoting another well-known physicist, and this is what he said, or what he wrote, rather, about Sir Roger. He's the most creative person and the person who has contributed the most ideas to what we do. He's one of the very few people I've met in my life who, without reservation, I call a genius. Roger is the kind of person who has something original to say, something you've never heard of before on almost any subject that comes up. So what do we mean by that? Well, some of you may know Roger Penrose because of his work on consciousness. Brilliant, uh, controversial, but um, really interesting. And you may know him uh, in particular through two books that he wrote about the subject. One of them is called The Emperor's New Mind, Concerning Computers, Minds, and the Laws of Physics, and the other is called Shadows of the Mind. Or you may know him because of Penrose tiling, a way of, in an aperiodic way, of covering a, a floor with tiles. This was him playing, but it turned out to be now at the forefront of a branch of physics called quasi-crystals. Or in a, more per in a more playful way, you may know his work about, um, well, the Penrose Triangle, the Penrose T-Bar, the ascending, descending staircase. These are all creations of his, which then have appeared later in the original and interesting um, works of M.C. Escher, influenced by Penrose. But tonight, we're going to be discussing quantum mechanics and relativity, the two pillars of modern physics. Um, it's fair to say that Sir Roger has thought as much or more about these two subjects than anybody else in the past 50 years. And I do mean 50 years. You can go back to 1967 when he introduced the notion of twisters. I won't describe it here. Or the famous Penrose-Hawking theorems on singularities in black holes. Um, these are both areas that seemed strange and different when they first appeared, but now are at the forefront of uh, research in quantum mechanics and relativity. He's already expressed some of his views in two books that have appeared recently or in the past decade or so. One is called Cycles of Time and the other is called The Road to Reality, a complete guide to the laws of the universe. But he has never done this as thoroughly and in as much detail as the book we will be discussing tonight. Fashion, Faith, and Fantasy in the New Physics of the Universe. A book that less alliteratively might have been called String Theory, Quantum Mechanics, and the Big Bang. So, 
Without any further ado, let me ask you to welcome Sir Roger Penrose. So, Sir Roger, before we start the serious business of the evening, I need to ask you a question that was posed to me by my eight-year-old grandson. And um, he's reading about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. And he asked me if when you were knighted, um, you had to kneel before the queen and she had a sword which she put on your shoulder. I told him I, I really didn't think so. In fact, I was quite sure that was not the case. But he said, uh, Grandpa, would you mind checking it out for me? <laughs> so I thought I would ask you that. Well, it's a very difficult problem because you do have to kneel, and it's very specific which way down you go, whether oh. it's the right or the left. And I've always had problems knowing which, which is which. <laughs> <laughs> but they, ha they know about this because they have a special chair which when you sit on it, you can only do it one way. <laughs> so there may be lots of people like me who don't know one from the other, and, and, and some of them actually, yeah, you, they get knighted from time to time. I see. Well, yeah. I suppose you could turn around, but then you would have your no, back to no, the queen, that, that, and you're that's not right. allowed to you do could, that. I think that would not be thought of as a good thing. That's true. Well, <laughs> since we're going into these details, <laughs> do you then have to walk backwards, or can you turn around and walk? I think you... You know, I think I did it wrong anyway, so, so it, <laughs> she's very good-natured. I don't think she worries too much about it. Well, she may, but she doesn't, she doesn't let on. Good, um, good. And uh, I don't, if there is a little bit of walk, it's only a step, but I don't, you may step back one step and then go off. There's none of this, you know, <laughs> going right back through the door, and I don't know how you do it if you don't quite right, know where the door right. is. But definitely no sword or saber or anything like that on the shoulder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes? Yes, there's a thing like that, yes. I'm not sure what you call it, but yes. It's just a slight touch on the shoulder. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think, I don't remember much about it, quite honestly. <laughs> but yes, oh. I think so. It happened so quickly that I, I didn't quite oh. make, n notice it. And probably there was more than one person being knighted, I, I would oh, imagine. Oh, yeah, there were hordes of them, yes. So yes. <laughs> you have to keep <laughs> moving. <laughs> yes, that's right, yes. Oh, absolutely. And they weren't just being knighted. There were all sorts of other honors. That, you know, that, hey, our country gives lots of these things. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Did you meet any interesting people when you were being knighted? And then we'll stop, okay. <laughs> I, I did s sit next to... You see, the, the, the females get knighted too, but they're called dames. Yes. Yeah, da I know dame means something else in America, but... But, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a respectable thing to be a dame, yes. And I was, I sat next to, no, that's quite a lot of my head. It Names is in of Broadway so musicals now. also, you know. Yeah, 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 that's right. No, I, it wasn't really an opportunity to meet people. They, they, they were sort of, you just in and out, oh, I've what? ruined it now. Yes. You just, it was more or less a sort of one, on, one after the other like that. You know. Keep on moving, Sir yes, Roger. Yes, <laughs> sort of thing, yes, yes. Well, all right. This is fun, but I think the audience did not come here to listen to the fine points of being knighted. And in fact, <laughs> I will underline this by from now on calling you simply Roger. Good. All right. Um, so, Roger. I thought you were just going to call me. Oh, so. So, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> yes. So, let's start then with. <laughs> Your book is, I'm going to call it string theory, well, I won't. Fantasy um, is the third. Yep. Fashion. Fashion is string theory. And as I'm sure everybody in the audience knows, the dream is really to find a way to combine, well, one of the dreams, it's the kind of thing physicists dream of, is combining the two great ideas of the of uh, physics in the 20th century, quantum mechanics and relativity. Um, and the most popular um, attempt, at least in the past 30 years, has been string theory. Now, Roger, like those knights of old and of new, 
is a brave person, and he has no hesitation in challenging. In fact, I think he rather enjoys challenging the f fashionable view, and he certainly has challenged the fashionable view of string theory, and he's done so for some very good reasons. And um, I'd like to start by asking you in a few words, can you tell us some of the reasons why you do not believe in I should, the standard uh, view. Let me qualify this discussion a little because I should say I have nothing against string theory as such. I think, well, first when I heard of the idea, I thought it was a wonderful idea. Yes. And it is a very beautiful idea which um, attempts to address this problem that you have in quantum field theory, that is quantum theory of fields, uh, it's re when you combine special relativity with quantum mechanics, not the curved spaces, but the right. thing with the speed of light and all that. Um, and uh, 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 it, it's a nice idea. But what, why, uh, when I first heard about it, I really did like it. Uh, it was um, Lenny Susskind explained in the early days, and yeah, fantastic idea. But what I didn't like was when they decided that the theory only made sense when your space-time was 26-dimensional. So you had to have 25 dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And I said, okay, that's it, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. Because we don't have 26 dimensions. And of course, they were saying, well, well uh, most of them are all tied up in a little knot, and you don't see them because they're so small. But uh, I have various reasons for not And they've thinking. given very colorful descriptions of, you know, ants yeah. crawling around wires and things like yes, that. Yes, yes, that's right. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, or a hose pipe. Just the hose pipe thing. also. I have a nice picture of a hose pipe. Yes? In my book, yes. But it's, um, the idea is that if you look at the hose pipe from a long way off, it looks one-dimensional. But then you get close and you see it's actually got two dimensions because they're looking about the surface of the hose pipe. Because it's such a small thing, you, you might regard it as a one-dimensional space, which is not a bad idea. And they point out that this idea goes back to a theory which came out not so long after Einstein's general relativity by a German, or Polish-German, I guess, German f mathematician or physicist called Kaluza. And he a brilliant idea, actually, that by adding an extra dimension to space, so you had a five-dimensional space-time, you could incorporate not just gravity, which Einstein's theory did, but also electromagnetism. So this wonderful theory of Maxwell, which unites electricity and magnetism and explains light at a classical level, and one of the truly great theories of physics. Right. And, uh, you, when you combine that with general relativity, there's a way you do it, which is perfectly natural. But it's very neatly encompassed in this Kaluza theory. But the thing is, I have not, nothing wrong, I have nothing against that theory. So I should explain the technical point which worried me. And it's a bit hard because it's a slightly technical point. It's actually not that hard to understand, but it's to do with what's called functional freedom. Now, you see, uh, you normally think of one, two, three, four, those are finite numbers, and infinity, okay, that's the rest. Well, we know that's not true. One, two, three, four, and then infinity. Well, <laughs> yeah, there are a few others in between, this. But I mean, infinity, or ordinary integers, and then you might say, okay, you can talk about the lot of them, yeah. and that's infinity. Well, there's a great mathematician called Cantor who showed that, no, there are big infinities and small infinities. So it's, it's a very beautiful theory. Now this is another way of talking about infinity. But it's not Cantor's, because Cantor is basically counting. I won't go into that theory. Uh, there is a little bit in it in my book, but hardly any, because that's not what it's about. It's about a different way of talking about infinities, where you could say the number of points in a plane is an infinity which is bigger than the number of points on a line. And the number of points in space is bigger than that on the plane. But that's not the real point. The real point is how many functions or fields can there be on a line or a plane or a three-dimensional space. And the number of dimensions is critical. So you might think of a theory which, say, think about temperature, that's got one value at any point in space. Or you might think 
of an electric field, and that's got three values because it can point that way, that way, or that way, and it can have a, a strength in each direction. So you can have different number of components. Okay, that's, you could say there's more freedom in electric fields than there is in, in a field of temperatures. But that's much bigger when you're talking about fields on a higher dimensional space. That completely swamps everything else. So if you have a theory which has extra space dimensions, and if all those extra space dimensions are like, are they really like space, so that you can vary them all independently, then the amount of freedom in those fields utterly swamps everything else. And so why don't we see all that? It would, it would completely swamp everything. So this was my re real objection. To have a theory which has spaces of more than the three dimensions we experience, you've got to say why those dimensions, why, why those extra dimensions of space don't have floods and floods of freedom that, that that's actually swamp everything else. But let me ask you, I mean, what you're saying is that the functional freedom or the freedom of having all these extra dimensions and yeah. Uh, by the way, they've gone from now, they talk about 10 dimensions, only 10 dimensions. Yeah, they brought it down from 26 to 10. That's that right. was a great achievement. But yes. they will not bring it down to four, okay? Mm. So in that sense, the... It's gone um, up to 11 quite some time, too. Yes. That's right. It slipped back a bit. Yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Sorry, yeah. In that sense, your view is rather conservative. You're saying... Oh, yeah. Um, we know there are four, and we should have a theory of four dimensions. Yeah. But why do you think your criticism of extra, of functional freedom, why do you think um, yeah. well, I, I can, yes, it hasn't been you. taken up well, so there, much by the string theory? That bigger community. question is a good question, but let me come backtrack a little bit, because I had brought this up with people. And yes. they would say, oh no, the amount of energy you would need to excite these extra dimensions is huge you would need, you see, they're thinking in terms of particle accelerators. And they would say what you need is the energy of, I mean, they don't say it this way, but it's the, what they call a Planck energy. Yes. The Planck energy is something like the energy of a sizable artillery shell. So right. you have this artillery shell, and the idea is could you make a particle zip along so fast that it would have the energy of, of a sizable artillery shell. They said, well, that's way out of the limit. Right, an artillery scale. shell concentrated <laughs> in something, yes. you know. Yes, okay, now if that was the end of the story, yes, that would be an answer. But what they somehow seem to miss, and I, I don't, I, I'm really puzzled in a way, you, your puzzlement is, yes. is my puzzlement. What they seem to miss, and I'm sure they don't really, is that that energy is to excite not just the extra dimensions here, but throughout the entire universe. Mm -hmm. So it's this energy of the artillery shell to ex excite to the first mode, if you like, is for the entire universe the energy in an artillery shell. That's a ridiculously small amount of energy. Okay, if you think you're going to do it with, a, with an accelerator over here, and, sh and suppose somebody in a, on a remote planet had an accelerator that powerful, is that going to go whoomph and the whole universe would be wrecked by that experiment? Right. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. Right. So it's, it, the point is that it's, it may seem like a big energy uh, if you're just thinking of particle accelerators, but if you're thinking of the whole universe and what kind of energy you've got there, well, I, in my book I have a picture of the, a little picture of the Earth going around the sun. You see how much energy is the, in that Earth motion around the sun? Well, it, I don't know how many millions, it's a million, 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 million times the energy that you need in this artillery shell. I mean, it's ridiculous. That energy is freely available in motions in the solar system. You don't need to go that high. And, and why don't, does a little bit of that energy go to excite these extra dimensions? Mm -hmm. And I don't know an answer to that because nobody has ever given me an answer. I mean, do you think that um, string theory is... Um, well, people have, um, the people who work at it have been, um, they're believers, they're true believers, yeah. you know? It, it's a funny question because um, they say it's so beautiful. Their mm. ideas are so beautiful that they have to be true. <laughs> um, Risky one, that one, and, yes. And that's a, tr <laughs> yes. that's a tricky argument because um, throughout history, as you say, and um, 
there have been extraordinarily beautiful ideas, yeah. but um, they're not true. Well, um, I, I like to... What the, the experiment first, contradicts yeah. them, you well, know? The first picture in my book is an ancient Greek theory, you know, where you have fire and water and air. That's right. And these correspond to the polyhedra. And uh, we don't believe that anymore. But it's actually quite a beautiful theory because I, I didn't realize this at first. You, see, you take two cubes, you can cut, cut them up and make two tetrahedra and an octahedra out of them. And you see the cube corresponds to, to earth or solid things, you see. So you take two sticks and you rub them together and you make fire and smoke. And so you, you have the idea that you have these two cubes and that's... That, that's <laughs> That's Earth. And then <laughs> you make fire and Earth. And you can do that, that geometrically. So it wasn't simply, you see, the theory had a little bit more to it. It wasn't just an idea and you have this poly polyhedra. There's a little bit of, you know, explain something. Not much, I agree. <laughs> well, there is a, a phrase which I thought was attributed to, um, to Kepler that um, geometry is the archetype of beauty in the universe. Really? And the idea of beauty, um, mm in a theory is something that has changed. I mean, clearly, mm. at one point, the circle or the sphere was the most beautiful form, and therefore, even if you had um, epicycles on epicycles and so on, um, that was all right, because you did it with circles and spheres. Yeah. But at a certain point, we found that actually the motion of planet is ellipses. Mm. So it's... Um, well, it's Kepler, experiment. Kepler tried everything, you see, because he did try, you know, with polyhedra and putting them inside each other and trying That's to explain right. the orbits that way, and that didn't really work. I have a great uh, admiration for Kepler. I think he was fantastic. And, and he had these ideas, and think of how much work it was to extract the information that these really were ellipses out of, out of what the observation. You, you, That's you right. see the planets going like this. That's and, right. And how do you get an ellipse out of that? That's a huge amount of work. An insight. And, and, and that is, I think, one of the, I mean, traditionally in science or through the centuries, one has had beautiful ideas, but at a certain point, you're faced with the experimental Absolutely. data. Sure. And part yeah. of this is that I think a great number of superstring theorists are captured by the, the beauty of yeah. the mathematics, it's, and it's there's nothing in the experiment mm. to contradict it. It's also quite paradoxical in a way because they come up with these, uh, well these, what are these, ex what shape are these extra dimensions in the theory? Yes. Well, there are these spaces called kalabi spaces. Right. And these are very beautiful mathematical structures with uh, very interesting properties and have implications back in mathematics which the pure mathematicians didn't know. And so, yes indeed, that's fantastic, it's very beautiful. But when you look at the theory that they produce, it's a great mess. Because you've got these nice manifolds studied very carefully by mathematicians and so on. But what is the picture that they produce as a whole? You know, Einstein had a picture put together and you have space and time and you can understand what these things mean. And yeah, you can see that's a beautiful scheme which hangs together. But here, you've got these sort of things and they're in different numbers. You have these things which have different ways of vibrating and the number of dimensions is different in each way and you've got to understand how that works. And there's, it's, it's not a coherent picture as a whole, as a physical picture of what's going on. There are beautiful things in it, I agree, but as an overall picture of what's going on in the world, I don't think it is beautiful. But then that's an, you know, an aesthetic reaction, how much... Yes. You say, yeah, it's got to be experiment, and I completely agree with that. No, when I say completely agree with that, I don't completely agree with it. <laughs> because, you see, I want to be careful at these things, because this happened to me before. Because I gave the title to the book, Fashion, Faith, and Fantasy, and the fantasy had to do with uh, cosmological schemes. Yes. To do with the very early universe, which I had a lot of trouble with. Yes. And I was saying, you know, fantasy, okay, we don't want fantasy in science. But then, in the meantime, you see, this was 13 years ago when I gave these talks originally. Then, in the meantime, I come up with my own theory, which is pretty, pretty fantastical, you see. So, that, no, no, fantasy is actually not a bad idea. You, it's, you've got to be the right fantasy, that's all. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And fantasy is in the eye of the beholder. And fantasy is also. Yeah. By the way, I forgot to say in the introduction that when we talk about mathematics and 
geometry and so on. Um, Writer's PhD in, is in mathematics and in a field particular called algebraic geometry. So he knows whereof he speaks. <laughs> well, it was very interesting because I, I was a graduate student in Cambridge and I was doing so called, oh, I was so called doing algebraic geometry, put it that way around, because what I was doing was not the fashionable, fashionable thing. I was going off on my own in an area which interested me. As you have done so often in your <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah, well that's, I don't know, it's a bad habit. Well, it was a, actually it was a problem suggested my, by my supervisor. I should say my then supervisor because he then shoveled me off for somebody else after a while. But it was, he set the problem. And I this was the famous Sir Hodge of? Yeah. Of Hodge William numbers. Hodge. And yes, yes, Hodge numbers, Hodge, that's right. Uh -huh. No, he was, a, he was a nice man. He was too nice, and well, that was the trouble, you see, because I'd, he'd ask me, what, what, what had I been doing, you see, over the past week? I'd see him once a week. What had I been do doing over the past week? And I might say, well, I've been doing this and this and this. And he, each time I said, very interesting, that's very, very interesting, very interesting. And then I came up with something and I said, well, actually, the, the way you try to solve this problem actually doesn't have a solution. Very interesting, very interesting. <laughs> and what I didn't realize, he didn't believe a word I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> because it wasn't until... <laughs> two and a half years later, when I was sitting in a seminar, and he came up to me and said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and it was that took that. <laughs> <laughs> he worked, he'd worked it out himself on a particular example, and it turned out I it was, was correct. But, but he'd, ev evidently he hadn't believed me up to that point. <laughs> ah. By the expression on his face, I could tell this was a great revelation to him. <laughs> um. You know, there was just a, a, one paragraph about that, I, just about that very question. Would you like to read just a paragraph? Oh, I have to warn you, I, I, I have this macular degeneration, which means I'll have trouble. I don't even have my reading thing. May but I read it for yes, you then? Please read it, okay. yes, yes. It just says, there are many other results of this kind in pure mathematics, and it is clear that for a profound new physical theory, we need a good deal more than just this kind of mathematics. Despite the subtlety, difficulty, and indeed somewhat even genuinely magical qualities that the mathematics may possess. Physical motivation and support from experiment are essential in order for us to be persuaded that there is likely to be any direct connection with the actual workings of the physical world. These matters are indeed central to the issue that we come to next. You know, and then you go on. Sure. So it's again this question of, and y you have a really interesting discussion of how you can be lulled by the beauty of a mathematical theory yes. into believing something is It's true. a very difficult thing. I mean, it's a, there isn't a clear answer here because I think it is true that there is somehow a special kind of beauty in the physics which applies to the, to the world. And certain people, well, I, the, the main person one refers to here is usually Dirac, who yes. discovered this equation for the electron, an amazing achievement. And he made some, st I don't, this can't be a direct quote, it's some statement like this. He said, um, I, have a, I have a very keen sense of the beautiful, and when I found my equation, I knew it was right. Now you see, <laughs> what do you do with that? Um, and it was right. He's been. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's the patron saint of people who believe their theory is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. I mean, clearly, it was beautiful. It was. It was yes, incredibly absolutely. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And it predicted, you know, antimatter and so on. And yeah. when the experimenters even found that, they didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. No, it was a so, huge um, achievement. Occasionally, being guided just by beauty gets you there, and it is a convenient thing to have. And in fact, it's a great thing to have a sense of the beauty of the universe. But then, you have to check it. If you are a physicist, you have to check it against experiment. Sure. Sadly. That, yeah, well, of course, <laughs> he won out there, of course, <laughs> directed. <laughs> I suppose if he got the wrong one and, and, he, and it didn't check out with nature, he might not have made that statement. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that is, um, 
And by the way, to keep their spirits up, and I don't mean to be overly critical, string theorists, about every 10 years there is something called a string theory revolution, mm -hmm. where there's a, a new mathematical insight that yeah. keeps spirits from flagging. But um, who knows what will happen there's next. There's always that, yes. Well, I mean, I, see, I suppose the thing, I mean, some people say, well, string theory it has no predictions, so why should we take it seriously? Now, you might study it because it's interesting mathematics. Well, of course. And it's stimulated by physical things. It, it, it certainly incorporates ideas from physics. Um, and it has proved very fruitful for mathematics, that's certainly. That's a curious thing, absolutely true. There are, yeah. there are certain areas of mathematics which have been transformed that's right. by, by some of these ideas which came from, quotes, physics. Right. Now, <laughs> but is it physics? Well, it's nice to, we've often said that mathematics has been the guide to physics, so it feels good as a physicist that occasionally we physicists can in, um, do a little bit of guiding of mathematics, you yes. know? Yes, well, that's true, that's true. So turning from, I think we've done a little bit about uh, <laughs> fashion, yeah. and um, I'd like to turn a little bit to uh, fantasy. You're skipping uh, faith, are you? Or do, you do want to I'm going to skip faith, you know. <laughs> um, okay, yes, fantasy, uh, right, yes. Faith, we might, we might end the evening with okay. faith, you Fine. know. Fine, that's all right, yes, yes. And fantasy is, um, it's certainly um, the idea of um, the Big Bang is, and the idea of cosmology is something that has captured not only science, but also the popular imagination. Yes. And um, again, um, you know, there is now also a great deal of experimental evidence most people oh, yeah. believe we we know what happened in the universe 300 from 370,000 years after the Big Bang. And there's even a good deal of evidence for what happened all the way back to fractions of a sexton. There's an excellent popular book written by now, at least 30 years ago, called The First Three Minutes by yeah. a very great physicist, Steve Weinberg. Yeah. And he talks about the universe well, I think it's the first three minutes and 40 seconds, you know. <laughs> yes. He wants to be precise. And then at the end, he says, well, there are conjectures about what happened in the first, let us say, billionth of a billionth of a second. Now, I think it's quite extraordinary that we as humans can have serious conversations about what happened in the first billionth of a billionth of a second. But Sir Roger now, sorry, Roger, says um, what some people call the first billionth of a billionth of a second may not be the first billionth of a billionth of a second. Oh, yeah. Well, let's see. I'm not sure about how many billions or what they are, because I, I have trouble <laughs> with billions because they changed. I know. I know. <laughs> but that's, but yes. What, what is the Big Bang? Is it an ex explosion which occurred at a given... Yes, yes. Time or well, is it something else? You see, the thing is, I was once interviewed by Stephen Sacker. This is an inter he's, a, he's a, usually in interviews um, you know, <coughs> dictators and people who've been. He in interviews who? Dictators and, and people who have. I see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, he's a very brave man. He talks yeah. to all sorts of uh, nasty My people. My experience nice people with Putin too. is limited, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it was soon after I had produced this scheme of mine. And, and he, th th he, it was an interview on the BBC w World Service. You can actually get it on the, on the web, I've noticed. I see. But anyway, he, he, he talked to me before they started. He says, well, I'm used to interviewing politicians and things, and I have to be uh, aggressive to them. That's part of the scheme. So don't be, don't be worried if, I, if, I'm if I'm rude to you. It's all part of the game, you see. <laughs> so, yes. so I said, that's <laughs> fine. I'll, I'll. So he said, why did you change your mind? You see, well, this is because I had written, as I think, he, these theorems that I had with Stephen Hawking, yes. which, which are showing, in a sense, that if, if general relativity is correct, then you must, and you, if you have certain conditions, like expansion uh, of a certain uh, amount, or, or in a black hole where you have collapse, 
then you've got to have a singularity if the Einstein theory is correct um, and the energies are not negative or something like that. So they're quite general arguments that you have to have singularity. So this was what he considered me changing my mind, you see. Aha. Uh -huh. So I so I said, well, you know, okay, scientists, if they think they've got a better idea, they're allowed to change their minds, you see. I'm not sure that's really what I thought, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you see, I'm not sure I think it, well, it was a change in mind. He was absolutely right, because the th previous thing I thought, and had I been asked, you see, when Stephen Hawking was asked, I know, somebody asked him, what happened before the Big Bang? And so he said, what I would have said before all this, I would have said, as he said, it's meaningless question to talk about it because space and time were created in the Big Bang and therefore the very notion of time only came into existence with the Big Bang and so the idea before doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And I would have said just that, you see. So it was a change of mind to say that, no, I think there was something prior to the Big Bang. And uh, I had to describe this idea uh, and I considered, although it was a change of mind in that sense, sense it wasn't really a huge departure. It wasn't at any stage a departure from Einstein's general relativity. So you're calling me a conservative earlier on, and I am a conservative yes. in the sense that, that yes. I think Einstein's theory is magnificent, and I don't really believe these theories which try to muck it up and change it in one way or another. Partly because it's such a beautiful theory, but, but <laughs> nowadays <laughs> it's because... it agrees so extraordinarily well with observations and recently the LIGO thing with his gravitational waves. The LIGO thing is yeah. the observation of gravitational waves earlier this so that, announced that's earlier this year, which was just an astounding yes. experiment, yep, really. Yep. Uh, so, sorry, where was I? Um, yes, sorry. <laughs> before. We got carried yes, away yes, by yes, how beautiful yes. that experiment yes. was. But gravity. Well, you see, there's something that had worried me for a long, long time. And this is... Well, the two things that worried me. One thing had worried me for a long time, and the other thing worried me. One is recently. general relativity, and the other is quantum mechanics. Those, <laughs> those worry me too, but no, that's, this is yes. not those particular worries. Although absolutely intimately connected with those two worries. One of them had to do with the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is familiar to people. Maybe they know what entropy means, or maybe they don't. But entropy, roughly speaking, is a measure of the randomness. That's, that we could say that, roughly mm -hmm. speaking. And the second law of thermodynamics tells you that the randomness increases, the entropy increases with time. And so, roughly speaking, that's a kind of depressing law, in a sense. But it's telling you that things get more and more disorganized with time. It isn't quite saying that, but that'll do. Now, another way of saying the same thing is if you go back in time, things get more and more organized, less entropy, things get more and more organized. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the best piece of evidence for the existence of a Big Bang? Well, there's this thing called the microwave background, which is radiation coming to us from all directions, and it's microwave radiation, it's electromagnetic radiation, and people call it the flash of the Big Bang cooled down by the expansion. It's not really the flash of the Big Bang, because it, it came when you, you gave that figure, which I always forget about how many 100,000 yeah. years ago it was. Right, 370,000 <laughs> yes. years, when, something like yes. that. Yes, and that is what you're actually looking at. It's not quite the Big Bang, but nevertheless, it's sort of early on in the universe, mm -hmm. and uh, that is a very good indication, if not of the Big Bang, but of the fact that there was an extremely hot, concentrated state of this universe that we know. Now, one of the big features of this, with, of the first, the COBE satellite, when they looked at this radiation carefully, was this spectrum of the frequency. So you see, watch the intensity with different frequency. And you find this nice curve. And that curve is the famous Planck curve, which Max Planck explained, which was the, or the beginning of quantum mechanics. And what it means to a physicist, if you see that spectrum, what are you looking at? You're w looking at thermal equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Now, what is thermal equilibrium? Thermal equilibrium is a state of maximum entropy. Now that was what I call the mammoth in the room. Because maximum entropy, you're going back down and down and down and down until you get to a maximum. 
Now, you don't have to be a sophisticated mathematician to see there's something funny going on there. But how can it be at its most random state to begin with and yet get more and more random afterwards? Well, people might say, oh, well, the universe was pretty small in those days. and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not the reason. I can tell you that's wrong. <laughs> that's not the reason. The reason is that what you're looking at is only something, you're looking at radiation and matter. And those things are pretty well in equilibrium. The universe is expanding, so it's, you have to take that into account too. But apart from that, yes, it is thermal yeah. equilibrium, maximum entropy state. But there is something which is very low entropy, and that is gravity. And it seems to be gravity and only gravity. So we not only have a very special state in the early stages, but we have a very special state which is very special in a very peculiar way. That only one of the forces of nature, if you like, is somehow completely co co constrained down to a very, very low level. Now, you see, what happens with the unit, you can see it, it makes a lot of sense. Because what happens is a very uniform state is gravitationally a very low entropy state. So it's very organized by being uniform. And as time goes on, matter starts to clump and produces galaxies and stars. Yeah. And these stars get hot, and we have the sun, the nice sun of ours, and the cold sky it lives in, and this is what we live off. We have an entropy and balance, and, and that whole of life and so on comes because of that bright spot in the sky. And that comes about, okay, nuclear forces and all sorts of things going on, but the main thing is the sun is there, and it's there because of gravity. And it's only because there was this uniform state initially which has the potential to condense into objects like stars. And that initial state is a real puzzle. It's the mammoth in the room. You ask the cosmologists, say, what are the main problems in cosmology? You don't understand what they say, dark matter. And we don't understand dark energy. Galaxy formation is a puzzle. And we don't know this and that. And the other thing. Any mention of this? No. It's never mentioned. Yeah. I've never seen it mentioned in, in, in one of the big problems. Right. To me, it is the biggest puzzle of the, where the universe came from. Mm -hmm. Now, I, that was just a thing of me hanging around. I'd worried about that for a long time. Now, the other thing was worrying me about, I was just sitting and worrying about the universe. That's people like me do that sometimes. <laughs> and I was worrying about the distant future. And, okay, it's a nice, exciting universe we're living on now, but the universe will keep on expanding. It does this exponential expansion, this so-called dark energy or Einstein's yeah. cosmological constant, which is producing this expansion. And it'll keep on going and expanding, expanding. And things get pretty boring. Okay, then you've got these black holes. They're the most exciting things there, left pretty well. What do they do? Well, Hawking says, and I agree with him, these black holes will gradually radiate away. And so their mass will go, their energy will go, their mass will go. This will take, for the biggest black holes, something like a Google years, 10 to the power 100. Uh, one, one followed by 100 zeros. That's a big number. That's a big number, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we talk about bigger numbers in other respects, but that's a big number, yeah. And okay, it's a big number, but the universe is you know, doing its stuff, expanding, expanding, getting colder and colder. And the black holes go away. They're all gone. Now, that's the very boring era. It was only the boring era before. This, this is the very boring era. There's absolutely nothing. Radiation, very cold, photons drifting around. Well, you know, I agree this is an emotional argument. But I, somehow I thought, well, it's boring, but who's going to be there to be bored by this universe? <laughs> only pho not us, but photons. And it's damn hard to bore a photon. <laughs> well, you see, partly because probably photons have experiences, but that's a subject yes. we don't talk about here. Yes. Um, but the real reason that I mean here, the point I'm getting at here, is that photons don't experience the passage of time. That they're going along the light cones, and the time dilation takes it to zero. They d there's an, a photon's creation to its absorption somewhere as far as the photon is concerned, is zero time. And that is conventional relativistic physics. That yep. the, all modern physicists believe that. And it's... Uh, ah. Now, if it's only the photons, they're not bored at all. Um, you know, if they had a, The point is, 
the pro you see, it ties up with work I did ages before, when you talk about infinity. You can think about infinity. There's a very nice picture, which perhaps people know here. There's two of them in the book, which is an Escher picture, which shows maybe angels and devils forming a tessellation, and they get crowded. It's inside a circle, and they get very crowded up against the edge. And these in angels and devils inherit, inhabit inhabit a geometry which is called hyperbolic geometry. Don't worry too much about that. But the point is that this is a nice representation which is called a conformal one. Now what does conformal mean? It means that shapes, small shapes and angles are correctly depicted, but the size you can stretch or squash as long as the stretching and squashing is isotropic. You squash as much that way as you do that way. Mm. So the shapes get pretty well preserved. And that's a nice kind of geometry. I used to play around with yes. it a lot. Conformal yes. geometry. Yes. And in conformal geometry, you can talk about infinity. So in that nice Escher picture, where's the infinity for these angels? And it's that yes. nice circle around the outside. Mm. So as long as you've got physics, which respects conformal geometry and not the metric, infinity is just another place. And you could have, a and so I'm you saying could have another kind of universe. That's the point. You could say I that boundary, outside that boundary, is somewhere else. Yes. And that was the idea. And why it makes sense here is that it's, okay, there are a little problem about electrons running around, but let's forget them for the moment. <laughs> it's mainly photons. The predominant matter will be photons. And those photons are, they respect Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations aren't interested in the metric. They interested in conformal geometry. And those photons are not bored. They're not bored because there's infinity. They're going to whack there. They get right into it. And then where do they go? So uh, coming back to uh, the unification between quantum mechanics and uh, relativity, there are alternative theories. Uh, you, you, the, uh, in your discussions, it, it, uh, it sounded like there's, only, there's one string <laughs> theory, but there are 10 to the 500 powers, 10 to the 500 power of uh, is the number of different string theories. And this is one of the things that makes it so suspicious. suspicious. But, mm. but I'd like to know what other theories really are there, or the nuclear okay. of other theories sure. that have some sort of substance or could yeah. be pursued or are being pursued. What, uh, could you Thank tell you us about that? Thank you for your question. And sure. Well, th there is a little bit of, there's a, there's a graph which I got from Carlo Rovelli in the book. He, I should say, is one of the originators of, of the loop quantum gravity theory, which perhaps I should say something about that. That is, it's, it's rather ironic that you've got strings and then you've got loops and you might say which is which and they both sound <laughs> pretty similar. But they're quite different theories and they have, they're motivated in different ways. The string theory idea came more from thinking about particle physics, and gravity was a sort of afterthought, but then it became a gravitational theory. Whereas the loops were really created by people who were um, experts in, in general relativity theory. Ashtakar, the, the, uh, who was a in very distinguished Indian r relativity theorist, and uh, the work that he did was developed by people like Lee Smolin and, and Carlo Rovelli, uh, Ted Jacobson, and uh, this idea, how do I describe it? I, I can't really describe the theory, but it, what I always liked it better than string theory because they did take into consideration the basic issues that are raised by general relativity. So one of the basic principles of general relativity is that the coordinates are not important. You can use any coordinate system you like, and the theory has to be what's called generally covariant. So you, it doesn't depend on your choice of coordinates. And it's a very important principle that Einstein adopted in developing his theory. And they very much take this into consideration. It's very hard to do quantum mechanics under those circumstances because the way you normally do quantum mechanics is very dependent on a particular system of coordinates that are sort of flat space coordinates. And this is one of the reasons it's difficult to combine it general relativity and quantum mechanics. But uh, the loop variable theory, uh, I have certain problems with it too. They're a bit technical, so I won't go into it. 
I always, I, I have, it's partly my friends are loop variable people, you see. But, but in the de it, I, I think it's not a bad theory. It's an interesting theory. It's still not as, as relativistic, you might say, as, as I would like. There are versions which are more. There are things they call spin foams, which are developed from the loops. I'm not quite sure what I should be saying here. The, the thing is there are other theories in yes. the graph which uh, Carlo Rovelli, Rovelli gives. He's got string theory as the most popular, so that's not at the top. And then there's the loop, and he likes to put it with the loops coming up, you see this. They're sort of getting about halfway up. And then creeping along the bottom is twister theory, and that's my one. So, <laughs> so <laughs> But I never regarded twister theory as a, as a quantum gravity theory. It's, it's attempting to try and combine ideas of quantum mechanics and general relativity. But I'm afraid I would be straying into the faith. Should I stray into the faith business? The world of fashion is rich. Yes. Well, you see, combining quantum <laughs> field theory and general relativity is... To answer this problem, I really have to stray into the faith issue. Because it's the question is, what are you doing when you combine quantum mechanics and general relativity? Well, almost everybody who does what's called quantum gravity would say, we impose the rules of quantum mechanics on gravity theory. What we want is a quantized theory of gravity, a quantized theory of general relativity, and quantizing means applying certain rules that are adopted when you start with a classical theory that you understand and you bring it into line with the principles of quantum mechanics. And I say that is wrong, that what one should be doing is not trying to impose the rules of quantum mechanics on gravitational theory, but one should be looking for a much more even-handed marriage between the two, where there is give on both sides. So there has to be give on the quantum mechanics side. Okay, give on the general relativity side, I'm not against that. And that usually applies to ridiculously tiny scales when you're looking at, so the argument goes, scales which are sort of 20 powers of 10 smaller than what you're normally doing with particle physics. So it's ridiculously tiny. And Actually, sorry, and this is a central topic that you raise in part two in yes, faith. Yes, yes, that's you the faith. Know, so the how faith. to have, you know, that quantum sure. mechanics may need some reinterpretation. That's right. Too. It's very nice to see you in Philadelphia again. Uh, welcome <laughs> nice back. To be here. Um, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the requirements of, of having falsifiable hypotheses. I mean, the Dirac theory mm -hmm. predicted antimatter. If antimatter didn't show up, people would have thrown that theory out. If Einstein's mm -hmm. general relativity, which predicted star light paths would shift with if they went past the sun, if that was proved to be false, it would have right. disappeared. As that's of true. now, there is nothing that's, there are no falsifiable hypotheses of string theory, <laughs> which makes me think it's closer to faith than science. Um, there was a question which things would go into which chapters, and I wasn't totally sure about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so <laughs> the, the, I mean, that, uh, if you'd speak about that in general, I'd appreciate that. But the particular is you indicated you think that there are places where there is lots of energy much bigger than a human-made particle accelerator. Is, is there anything out of those big energies that could be turned into a falsifiable hypothesis? Well, that's the thing. I mean, that, uh, a lot of people object to string theory on the perfectly valid grounds that it's, as stated, not really testable. And, uh, okay, there are versions of string theory where they say, well, maybe the dimensions aren't as small as all that, and it's not uh, 10 to the minus... 35 meters, uh, but um, whatever it is. Um, they, there are versions of string theory where they're bigger, but those are kind of offshoots from the main theory. And sometimes people, well, maybe you'll excite these extra dimensions and, and, and the LHC will blow the, unit, the Earth up or something like that. Well, yeah, I mean, there are always tiny probabilities of these things, and that's a different argument. But, but uh, um, let's see, where were we going on this one? It, yes, you want theories which are falsifiable, and I completely agree with that. But you see, it depends what you mean by... The, I, I'm on slightly dicey ground here, you see, because twister theory is the thing which I do say a little bit in my book as a possible alternative route to make than string theory. But it's not meant to be a theory like that. It's not 
it's, it's a formalism. It's a different way of looking at physics. And it's, I mean, I'd love it to be something which made predictions, but it's not at that level. It's just a way where you can... Yeah. Yeah, here's an irony, you see. When I had, at the, the same time when I was giving the lectures, which started this book that, that we're talking about here, which was 13 years ago, and I had this t discussion with Edward Witten, who was one of the big proponents of, uh, s uh, of string theory and who made tremendous advances and certainly had a huge influence on pure mathematics. Um, but I, I went to see him after I'd given the first talk, which was on the fashion, and I, I was nervous that he would perhaps be annoyed that I'd been complaining about string theory. No, he didn't make, not a word of that at all. He mentioned something quite different, which was a relation with Trista theory. And it turned out this was the sort of starting point of a subject known as Trista strings, which is a way of, it's really a technique for doing calculations in very high energy physics. So when you can work out how these very mm -hmm. highly energetic particles, and it has relevance to the LSC, I should say. So this yeah. is honest physics because you're doing calculations. You're not changing the physics. You're actually calculating within known physics and it gives you techniques for calculating within physics. So there are theories which might have a value of that nature. They're just techniques which are useful. And as far as things go, that's what twister theory is. Now, it has ambitions to be more than that. Namely, I have, oh, actually, I don't know if theory has ambitions, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, to be more than that, because it has possibilities of ways of addressing the quantum gravity problem. But the, I don't try and do that what I'm trying to say here is a bit like the previous question in the, in, the, in the faith business, because I'm trying to say we shouldn't be looking for a theory which is a quantum theory of gravity. We should look, be looking for a theory where there is give on the quantum mechanics side. When you ask for experimental observations, that's where the observations will be, because although to look for the effects of quantum mechanics on gravity or in space-time structure. You're looking at experiments that are enormously outside the range of anything that could be done now. But you're looking the other way around. The effect of gravitational effects on quantum mechanics, these experiments are close to being done. There are experiments, I mean, it may be turned out that it's wrong, but there are ideas of at what level will quantum mechanics be falsified. And you can see that there are ideas coming from gravitational principles which are in conflict with quantum me mechanical principles. And there's a good chance that these principles will start to influence quantum mechanics and show that there are deviations from what the standard quantum theory predicts in actual experiments. And I think that could well come within the next decade. In connection with uh, the inter interpretation of quantum theory, uh, I was l looking at the, sort of the Bohr interpretation of an experiment, of experiment, and out of this evolved the discussion of uh, evolution of parallel universes <laughs> that yes. were somehow disconnected from our own universe and followed a separate history. Uh, what is your uh, reaction or interpretation of this? The parallel, well, all that stuff. Yes. Well, you see, that's really the faith chapter, so I'm glad that... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in the fact... Well, I have a, a, a nice picture of a, a mermaid. This was, was based on a lecture I gave in Erdense in, in, in Denmark because for some reason I'd been invited to give a talk in honour of Hans Christian Andersen, who <laughs> was coming up to his d bicentenary. And I thought, why am I giving a talk... <laughs> so these, you know, I was interested in that. I like the stories and so on. But I thought the reason must be that an earlier book I'd written was called The Emperor's New Mind. And this, of course, was a play on The Emperor's New Clothes, which was a Hans Christian Andersen story. So I thought maybe they wanted something of that. But I thought, no, no, I don't want to talk about that. Again. Well, let's think of something else. And I thought a bit, and I thought, ah, The Little Mermaid. And the, there were lots of different things. You see, I've been thinking about quantum mechanics. And the puzzle of quantum mechanics... Some people call it the interpretation of quantum mechanics, but I call it more than that. It's almost a paradox. Well, it is a paradox. But how do you do quantum mechanics? Well, you see, I have a picture in the book here. There's one on the back, too, which my transparencies that I uh -huh. use for lectures sometimes, the one I actually used in, in, in Denmark in this lecture, which I drew specially for that one. But then uh, I have a picture in the book which has this mermaid. And the point is, 
that there are three ingredients to the way quantum mechanics works. One of them is the quantum world, which is, and people don't normally quite think of it this way, but it's the way they do quantum theory. There's the quantum world, which I use the letter U for, that stands for unitary evolution, or another way of saying it, it's the Schrodinger equation. So the Schrodinger equation is a deterministic evolution of a thing called the quantum state, which you can say is the description of the, what the world is doing now, and it tells you what the world will continue to do as it evolves according to unitary evolution. And Schrodinger himself was very careful to point out that if you followed this, you could have a cat which was dead and alive at the same time. So this is the famous Schrodinger's cat, which Schrodinger introduced as a theoretical notion more or less to disprove his own equation. He didn't quite put it that way, but he was really showing the implications of the unitary evolution of the Schrodinger equation. And he says, look, this is ridiculous. Cats can't be like that. So there's something missing. Einstein agreed with him, there's something missing. De Broglie agreed, he had something missing. Dirac agreed. There's a nice quote in the book, which you have yes. to find, which says that he thought there was something missing, that the quantum mechanics is a provisional theory. And it's because of issues like this. Quantum theory predicts that if you have an experiment, okay, let's suppose it's, uh, well, you can have a, a Geiger counter, and that Geiger counter clicks if a particle enters it. However, that particle state could be a superposition of going this way, that way, and this way, and that way, and all that. And so it's, it could click if that particle's going this way, but it's going that way as well. So quantum mechanics says different things that the particle can do all ca sort of happen at once. And so it clicks and doesn't click. If that detector is to be treated according to the rules of quantum mechanics, it doesn't click. It both clicks and not clicks. And that's what leads to this many worlds idea. It's the idea is, okay, well, there's one experimenter sitting here, or one version of the experimenter, he's sitting here listening to the click, and he says, oh yes, there's the particle. And the, the same experimenter sitting there who doesn't hear the click because there's the parallel world in which the click doesn't happen because the particle's gone the other way. And so that experimenter has a parallel existence in this other world. And this is the interpretation I confess to say that in Oxford, we have a philosophy department which I think understands quantum mechanics probably better than any other philosophy department. I would think that's probably true, but they go along this ridiculous route of believing that <laughs> this unitary evolution must apply at all scales, which says, yes, all these universes coexist, and the one that hears the click and, the other, uh, and somebody else has a click uh, and the cat is dead and the cat is alive and there are all these different possibilities are all coexisting in worlds which are come, uh, sitting next to each other like this. And that's where you go. You, you, go. you are led into that picture if you believe that quantum mechanics is just this unitary evolution. But if you don't believe that and you believe that no, one or the other or the other or the other actually takes place in the world as we seem to observe, then you've got to do the other thing in quantum mechanics, which is what's called the reduction of the state or the quantum or the collapse of the wave function. And the mermaid, you see, has a tail in the quantum world. That's where all these strange creatures, seaweed and fish <laughs> and octopuses and things, that's the quantum world. Her tail is in that. She's quantum thing. But she's got the other part of her, which is in the classical world, which is the outside where you've got discrete objects and you've got people, buildings and mountains and things like that all around. And she represents this violation of standard quantum mechanics, which you, which you need in a certain sense, where unitary evolution is violated. Now, this is heretical to say this, because proper physicists don't say that. You say, no, 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 no. There is this faith. You've got to believe in unitary evolution. You talk about black holes. Yes, you've got to believe unitarity holds for black holes. That's why you get these funny things called firewalls. Otherwise, and they rip off your epaulettes. You yes, know. all sorts of things, you say. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the, that's the faith, you see. That's the quantum faith. You've got to hold to this belief that the unitary evolution is the whole, the, the, the sea in which the tail of the, of the mermaid is, is really the whole world. But the mermaid herself is mysterious and magical, and somehow she's able to emerge into the real world. And in the picture in the book, she's sort of looking down as onto the world as well. And 
giving a new perspective on the world. So I rather like um, thinking of that picture. Well, I, I can say that um, <laughs> the, there is a unitary evolution that Sir Roger will be outside in just a couple of moments signing <laughs> books, you know, okay. with almost 100% certainty. <laughs> well, you see, there's another version in this other one. No, no, there isn't. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So let us thank him then for a very interesting and stimulating evening.